Okay, so welcome everybody um, to Dharna Kosher Retreat Centre in Scotland on the 20th of May 2020. And um, so I'm here today uh, in the middle of our 2020 um, pandemic that's going on at the moment. And wherever you happen to be, you might be, we've got, this is a Zoom meeting and there's somebody in France, for example, there may be people in other countries. And uh, once it's uploaded to YouTube, that may be tuned in to, by people anywhere in the world and uh, maybe in years to come. So this is what you're looking at now. It's uh, Danakosha Retreat Center, which has been closed to visitors for over a month now, um, two months probably, um, since our lockdown. Um, so we're putting out this program of uh, online offerings, and uh, I'm one of I'm part of all that. And what I usually do at the beginning is um, I show you where I'm speaking from. So I'm in the meeting room and then just outside the window here you can see the retreat center and uh, so this is the shrine room um, where are we now yeah this just here this is the shrine room here and this is the link to the main retreat center and this is the cherry tree we've been watching um, week by week uh, what I've been giving these talks that uh, it was just in leaf when we first saw it a few weeks ago at the beginning of the lockdown and now it's burst into pink cherry blossoms and uh, some of them are already uh, falling down and gathering on the ground you can't quite see that now a few birds flying around Let's come back to me. It'd be nice to see that all the time, but then I just become a silhouette when that happens. So this is a sort of compromise. See a little bit of the outside here, but you can also see me. And This talk follows on from last week and follows on from the week before. It's a kind of a part of a series of three in a way. And um, I've been talking about what Buddhist teachers always talk about, you know, impermanence and how to make our peace with impermanence. And um, when the Buddha was teaching, this is something that he, it was a sort of spiritual quest for him from when he was a young man and um, he had everything he could wish for materially and in terms of social status, he was royalty. But he, he saw through it all and realized that, well, none of the luxury and the status and the wealth and all this pleasure and that can't actually solve the problem of old age sickness and death um, which remains true to this day here we are 25 centuries after the buddha lived and taught and it's still true now and even though um a lot of us listening to this are probably living in these modern industrial consumerist societies um, where people are a lot of the time preoccupied with um, entertainment and buying things and trying to shore up their sense of security through establishing their property and their pension plans and um, 
in a way giving a lot of attention to what the Buddha would have regarded as merely worldly security. Um, but then during the pandemic, suddenly we can't help being much, much more aware of the fragility and transience of all that. Suddenly, seven days a week at this time, um, old age sickness and death, especially sickness, is right in our face every day of the week when we hear the news broadcasts. So we can't help seeing through the transience and insubstantiality of trying to base our sense of peace and security on material things. This is what the Buddha saw 25 centuries ago and it's what prompted him to set out on his quest, his spiritual quest, to make peace with the facts of old age, sickness and death. So that even in the midst of all that, he could still be at peace and open-hearted enough to reach out and care for others. And then he, once he discovered how to do that himself, he then shared that with his friends, his disciples, until they discovered it too. And that this has been going on for 25 centuries and it still continues. So I'm now teaching out of the same teaching tradition that the Buddha started 25 centuries ago and I'm still talking about what he was talking about that in view of sickness and old age and death um, you can't find peace just by attending to um, social status or material things or um, entertainments or pleasures you can't find peace by trying to forget about things like sickness and death because especially now you can't forget about it it's right in our faces day after day and I've been saying actually the last few weeks especially um, in the talk two weeks ago that it's actually an opportunity from the Buddhist perspective from the Buddha's perspective he would have said well in some ways this is a good thing because now there's much more chance of people waking up to the reality of the human condition which is that we are all subject to old age sickness and death and that trying to escape the truth of that and pretend it's not like that and immerse ourselves in entertainments and pleasures and illusions of the security of wealth and social status, all of that is not helping us to effectively come to terms with the human condition. The only way to do that is to make our peace with the facts of old age, sickness and death. So from the Buddha's point of view, the fact that we can't help being very aware of it right now and a lot of people are feeling the insecurity of that, the anxiety that that creates and are seeking to find a solution to that anxiety stirred up by that awareness, then perhaps some of them, including the people watching this right now, will seek it out in the Buddha's teachings which is to find the place of peace, which is how enlightenment came to be described sometimes metaphorically, the place of peace, a way of being at peace even in the midst of impermanence, even when we are, you are embodied within an aging body and you're surrounded by friends and family uh, who are embodied in aging bodies and we are all getting older 
and eventually we will all become sick and we will all die but nonetheless it's still possible to be at peace with all that steady and grounded and encouraging reaching out to people and helping them to find that peace and steadiness helping them to regain their courage in other words I was talking a lot about courage last week working with fear with courage and fear that was the title last week this week's title is grounded and encouraging grounded and encouraging and it's really about how once you have found a way to ground yourself effectively then you can take heart and feeling now encouraged you can then reach out and encourage others around you it's very hard to encourage other people if you just feel scared and um, groundless and panicking you know you're not really much used to other people uh, but if you can ground yourself in, a, in the way that the Buddha was grounded then you can be open out and be encouraging to others so this week I'm going to talk about how to go about doing that I mean the whole of the Buddha's system of practice were, were showing you make ways of doing that but particularly mindfulness and appreciation those two practices which of course we can bring into one practice of appreciative mindfulness and um, I've been talking about both appreciation and mindfulness quite a lot the last few weeks but this is how we can ground ourselves and um, what can we appreciate what can we feel grateful for well one of the things the, the most simple and direct thing is the sense of the steady ground uh, this it doesn't obviously it wouldn't work if you were in the midst of an earthquake somewhere um, although even in an earthquake the safest place to be is away from the buildings flat on the ground <laughs> even in an earthquake that's the safest place to be you know people um, when they are fleeing to safety in an earthquake they actually go away from the buildings and they come down to earth and then they lie down and touch the earth so even when the earth is shaking it's still the safest place to be and in tin, in trins, in, instinctively this is what people do they go to ground um, but if you're um, in Scotland we don't have earthquakes and uh, this hopefully is true for you too and uh, you can actually feel the earth feeling very very steady beneath you and that's a great blessing because by touching into that steadiness right there beneath your feet it helps you to steady your whole body and mind it helps you to steady your emotional state it helps you to take courage and uh, come calm down out of that het up anxious panicky state you just calm down <sighs> so appreciating the steadiness of the earth and then attending to that physically through mindfulness practice it's a very effective way of um, taking heart and grounding yourself when you feel scared I'm going to be um, leading a little meditation this week just for a short time a meditation of mindful breathing but particularly appreciating that steadiness of the steady ground and uh, you may already have done mindful breathing practice which is very beautiful thing to do very effective one of the things I love about mindful breathing 
is the out-breath. There's something intrinsically calming and settling about the out-breath. Um, we have this phrase in the English language, this idiom called sigh of relief. Because when you breathe out, it's an opportunity to get a sense of relief, settling, settling, settling. So that's what I love particularly about mindful breathing, that every out-breath is an opportunity to settle and calm down. And as the mind settles, as the body settles, then naturally your heart opens and you enter into a body-mind state that we know as creative mind, where you can be much more empathic and make much wiser choices. So the crucial thing when you feel scared, which is the natural thing in a crisis, is to ground yourself and calm down and enter into that um, other regarding wise, more insightful state of mind that we call creative mind. And these practices like mindful breathing are one of the best ways of doing it. When I lead this practice of mindful breathing, um, I, I'll suggest that you drop in a word as you're breathing out, and the word is, well it could be settling, or resting, or dropping, you can choose, wh whichever one works for you. Um, I particularly like settling. And um, what you're going to be doing is settling into the stillness of the steady ground. So that your mindful breathing is not just calming down sort of in isolation, not just calming down with a sense of I am calming my body and mind now, but it's settling into the steady ground. You see what I mean? So all the way through you've got a very clear sense that there's you in your body and your body is supported by the steady ground so that your awareness, your appreciative awareness of the ground beneath you is just as important as your awareness of your body and your breathing. And I find that this way of doing mindful breathing is even more effective than mindful breathing on its own. So if you can drop in a word like settling or dropping or resting each time you breathe out, it reminds you to remember to drop into the stillness of the ground and not just follow the breath, if you see what I mean. So let's just have a go at that just now. Um, just prepare yourself to meditate, so however you want to do that. You may have, you may like to adopt a particular posture for that, that's up to you. You don't have to look at the screen while you're meditating. Um, it's much more of a practice of feeling the sensations rather than looking. And uh, you may like to close your eyes. I usually keep my eyes open when I meditate to stop my mind wandering. But particularly notice the sense of your body and the, your bodily posture and especially the sense of touching the ground. So if you're sitting in a chair you probably get that sense of your feet resting on the ground and if you can place your feet side by side flat on the ground you get really strong sense of grounded feeling and 
of course you also get it through the steadiness of the seat you're sitting on which is held by the ground so as you sit here aware of your body supported by the earth you can just allow yourself to rest into that a sense of your weight being supported by the ground beneath you when we are hung up het up uptight in anxiety it's a bit like we're trying to just hold ourselves up somehow and we're sort of scared we're sort of um, but when you just let yourself be supported by the ground then you can settle into that it's something that you can trust because it just goes on supporting you moment by moment, minute by minute, hour by hour it's steady and you can allow yourself to trust that steadiness if that sets off trains of thought about can I really trust it? Just set those thoughts aside for the time being and just for the duration of this mindfulness meditation, just let yourself trust it. The steadiness of the ground beneath you. Let yourself be supported. Let the whole of your weight settle into that steady support. And each time you breathe out, it's a special opportunity to settle a little more, like a sigh of relief. Just to remind yourself, you could drop in a word each time you breathe out, a word like settling. So we're resting into the stillness of the steady ground. each out breath a new opportunity to settle a little more settling Resting into the tender stillness of the steady ground.
gradually as you settle into the stillness you may notice the tensions in the upper part of your body gradually loosening little by little, minute by minute, breath by breath. It takes time. But especially when you have plenty of time, you can really make time to, for a practice like this. Give it all the time it needs. Each out breath a new opportunity. Settling. Resting into the tender stillness of the steady ground. Well, I'm kind of reluctant to bring this meditation to a close because um, it deserves time just to really settle into it. But I've only got half an hour and I have other things I'd like to share with you today. So we'll just leave it at that for the time being. But you can always go back to it. Um, that was a, just a taster really, um, a way of doing mindful breathing practice with special awareness and appreciation of the steady ground beneath you and letting yourself um, rest into that, letting your weight be supported, letting yourself trust that steady support. When we get caught up in fear then you can get into a state where you feel as if you can't trust anything and you're constantly preoccupied with dangers and things not being reliable and things not being trustworthy and the only way out of that state it just is a vortex it's a it's a vicious circle the only way out of that is turning your attention to a sense of what you can trust and appreciate and then resting into that and even though the fear is there the f there's no no point in trying to chase fear away or stop fear you just it just feeds on itself if you do that but once you have established a sense of finding something that you can orientate to that you can trust even if it's only something as 
um, simple as the steady ground beneath you. That can be a way to calm down, steady yourself and then start to emerge out of the domination of the fear. And then even if the fear continues um, to some extent in the background, it's no longer dominating, it's no longer overwhelming you. That's the important thing because you have regained your courage. I was talking a lot about this last week in my talk working with courage and fear. So this week I've just given you a taster of a way of practicing mindful breathing which is one of the ways of putting that into practice. And uh, yeah, you may find that it's had some effect, that you feel a little bit, a little bit more relaxed and uh, a little bit more grounded and uh, a little bit more encouraged as well uh, at the prospect that this is something you could go back to and do again and again and again and you could make time for this kind of practice every day. Um, if you have got plenty of time, perhaps because you're self-isolating and you don't know what to do with all your time, then this would be an extremely good way of using your time. This could actually make the whole of the rest of your life, the whole of the rest of your day, um, much, much better quality because you have found a way of dropping out of that perpetual anxiety that seems to drive you back over and over again to hearing yet another news bulletin but then you hear yet another announcement of the latest death statistics and it just spirals your anxiety on and on and then people just get caught up in this vicious circle that just continues endlessly. A lot of our modern lives in consumerist society are just going round and round in a vicious circle too. It's kind of a combination of anxiety and craving, obsessive craving. Um, craving for entertainment, craving for information, craving for some way of distracting yourself from your uncomfortable feelings of anxiety inside your own body by looking at your Twitter feed or you're looking at your Facebook page or checking your emails or looking at another news bulletin or phoning a friend or there are a million ways that the modern consumer society has provided for people to distract themselves from the one thing that can lead them to peace, which is to turn in towards your own body and mind, this poor suffering being that you are, with patience and compassion, self-compassion and steady mindfulness. And just make your peace with how you're feeling. And eventually make your peace with what is scaring you too. That's the only solution to all this. No amount of rushing around trying to find distractions solves the problem. It just takes you away from the problem and perpetuates the problem. But actually right now we have an opportunity to go to trace the problem to the source. The source of all that anxiety and obsessiveness is within your own body-mind because it's a state of body-mind. So you have to come back to the body-mind and trace it back to the root and then find a way of solving it there. And mindful appreciation, the practices of appreciative mindfulness are a beautiful way of doing it. Something else for us to appreciate and be grateful for is how mindfulness ha 
about, when was it, 10 years ago or so, it became one of the mainstream strands of our Western culture, thanks to the pioneer, pioneer, pioneering efforts of people like John Kabat-Zinn. He found them originally on a trip to India in the 70s when he was on Buddhist retreats, but eventually when he came back to the West and started his career as a clinical psychologist in America, he was keen to bring them into the medical treatments of pain and anxiety and depression. And now they have been well established and welcomed in by mainstream Western culture thanks to that. So we're now living in a world in which we have access to mindfulness practice, very easy access to it because lots and lots of people are teaching it. We also have access to it through these modern um, facilities like YouTube and Zoom and internet and so on. And these very things that can cause a lot of trouble if we misuse them by distracting ourselves and be running away from ourselves can come to our aid if we only use them to seek out these beautiful simple practices of appreciative mindfulness which the Buddha taught 25 centuries ago and are, have always been there and are still available to this day. So do seek them out. Do seek them out. There's plenty there, plenty of resources. Our own, my own practice community, Taratna Buddhist community, has got plenty of stuff online available. Um, the London Buddhist Centre, for example, for the last, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years, I'm not quite sure how long. Um, one of their teachers is a psychiatrist who has made a speciality of using mindfulness in his treatment. And he's brought it into uh, part of the program of the London Buddhist Center. And so they run these mindfulness training programs. And uh, even now they are online and you can tune into everything that they're doing. Um, so they've got their own YouTube channel, for example, and uh, it's all there for you. It's actually this is I'm I'm appreciating the beauty, the the wonder, the opportunities of our modern life, um, and this itself is a practice that the Buddha taught: the practice of appreciation, gratitude, and this too can help us to come down out of fear and open out and be more compassionate and aware of other people around you. I'm just uh, pausing to just uh, look at what else I have to share today and looking at the clock to see how much time I've got to say it and just assessing what of this I can share. I've so much more than there is time for but uh, I don't want to overload the uh, talk with too much detail and anyway pauses are very helpful. Yes. Come back to the title of the talk. The title of the talk is Grounded and Encouraging, which is, you could say, a description of the Buddhist teaching. The Buddhist teaching was very encouraging, always has been, but also is grounded in practice. It's practical. It's not just a theory. It's something that you can actually grab 
um, put into practice and discover for yourself. So it's grounded in practice. But also the title means that when you yourself can find a way to become grounded in the sense of grounding yourself, stilling yourself, steadying yourself, then you become a resource for those around you. Having regained your steadiness and your courage, then you can reach out and encourage other people. And um, it's people need steady, grounded people when they're panicking and uh, you could be one of those people that they reach out to. But you have, to f you have to figure out how to ground yourself before you can help them with practices like the one I've just shown you. When we are het up, when we're all stirred up in anxiety, then we can also be very irritable and when you're dominated by irritation, which is a, a mild form of anger, that combination of anger and anxiety, you know, sometimes people get caught up in just flipping from one to the other. Angry blame, anxious fear, angry blame, anxious fear. It's, um, it's a torment. Um, it's a... Uh, it's, uh, being dominated by that kind of suffering is a torment, not just for you, but for the people around you. Um, people who are constantly caught up in anxiety and irritation, uh, fear and anger are hard to be with. But if you can settle down, drop out of that, steady yourself, you can come out of the domination of that. And then rather than being irritably aware of the faults of the people around you, and irritably aware of all the things going wrong in the world, once you have settled into that steadiness, you can start to appreciate the opportunities around you and appreciate the qualities of the situation and the qualities of the people as well. Our awareness, our perspective on life is so much dominated or influenced by our own mental states, isn't it? Our own state of body-mind. So when you're in a state of irrita irritation and anxiety, all you see around you is faults and problems and irritating people. <laughs> uh, even that phrase, irritating people, um, implies that the people themselves are intrinsically irritating, whereas actually the irritating, the irritation is not in them, it's within your own body-mind, it's your state of irritation that you're projecting onto them and calling them irritating people. The reality of the situation is just that they're people. And once you have calmed down and steadied yourself and grounded yourself and emerged so that you're not so dominated by your own irritation, then you can appreciate their qualities and you can also start to see the whole situation in a wiser, more other-regarding kind of a way and recognise that we're all suffering in this situation. It's not just that you're a pain and you're irritating me and will you please stop doing that, <laughs> where your whole awareness just kind of focuses in on them in a very narrow way, in a very kind of blaming and narrow and reactive kind of a way. Once you have calmed down, your whole awareness opens up and you just regain your somehow insight into the whole thing. We are all suffering in this situation, aren't we? 
It's not just you. It's not just you're the problem. It's just we all are suffering. So there's your suffering, it's your, your irritability, that's part of the suffering. Very likely the people around you are suffering too. Very likely they're all suffering from anxiety and irritability as well, especially if you're all locked up together in a little flat or something, you know. And uh, especially if you've got children, and uh, children can be very irritating as well, bless them. And it's not their fault, they can't help being the way they are. I can't help being the way I am. You can't help being the way you are. These other people around you can't help it. We're all suffering together. We're all in this situation and suffering together. But when you take that perspective, then the next step is compassion. It's kindly understanding. So then you just stop fixating on somebody else's faults and you just go quiet and you just relax a little bit and feel the ground beneath your feet, which is steady. There's stillness in that. You can feel it right there. Just take a little time to steady yourself by tuning in, resting into that stillness. And as you breathe out, let the whole of your body settle down, calm down and steady into that stillness. This is you coming to your senses in a way and grounding yourself once more and regaining that perspective that we're all suffering. And the best response to that suffering is um, compassion and patience. And when you lose your patience, trust be patient with that too because we all get impatient sometimes <laughs> <laughs> so the best way of responding to this suffering is with kindly understanding and patience and mutual forgiveness ongoingly mutual forgiveness continually messing up and hurting each other, lashing out um, with our words or maybe even worse with our hands and then asking for forgiveness and trying to find a way ongoingly of grounding yourself so you're not caught up in the whirl of your own reactive emotions like irritation which can flare up into anger and even violence like anxiety that can flare up into fear and panic and then blind panic and then you just don't know what you're doing you know in a blind panic you can end up hurting people and making a difficult situation even worse So grounding yourself, finding a way of calming down and settling into stillness is absolutely crucial in a crisis. It's the number one priority. I don't know whether there's a, must be some sort of etymological link between crisis and crucial. I don't know, I get fascinated by these things, but I'll leave that for now. You can check it out later. But in a crisis, this is what is crucial, actually, to ground yourself and touch into the stillness. Otherwise, you just become one more of those panicking people who are blindly rushing around, making it worse for other people. But once you have found a way of grounding yourself, then you can be one of the steady, encouraging ones, helping other people to regain their courage and steadiness. 
And then one by one, we can all regain our, sort of come to our senses, regain our steadiness. And then together, we can just consider, okay, this is where we're up to, this is what's going on, where do we go from here? What is the wisest way to proceed for us? So this is the sort of thing that the Buddha would gently say if he was present in your household while you're in lockdown, while you're surrounded by family members all cooped up together and feeling irritable with each other. This is the sort of thing that the Buddha would say if he was present and I'm saying it on his behalf. The beautiful thing is that the ground is always there, it's always there. You can touch into it. And the ground is not just there physically, but it's there as a symbolic reminder of that deeper sense of stillness that is eternally a possibility for you all the time. Constantly we have this reactive mind that we get caught up in, but there's always that possibility of settling back into the creative mind that is there. It's, it's, it's an opportunity that is ever present in all situations at all times. So the, the sense of the steady ground beneath you is a symbol for that. That sort of deeper level of human consciousness that is always available if you can just drop into it, settle into it, ground yourself in it. So rather like, um, no matter what's going on in your family, you know, there might have been all sorts of rows today and people flying off the handle and getting into a state and all that sort of thing. But all the time, the ground has been there supporting you and supporting your other family members and supporting the furniture. Just steadily and silently and just supporting, supporting, supporting. It's always been there, even when you forget about it because you're caught up in your state. The ground is nonetheless there and it's there for you to feel when you need to come out of that state and steady yourself and ground yourself again. So it's a bit like all the time that you've been up in the whirl of your emotional states, the ground is always there to come back to. And I think that's a beautiful um, metaphorical symbol for that deeper level of consciousness that is always there available to us. It's as if behind or beneath the world of our emotional states, especially our reactive emotional states, there's a kind of quiet stillness, even a tender, compassionate stillness that is just aware of it all, aware of the whole situation and is very, very patient, not just very patient, that's um, an understatement that is completely immune to impatience, that's utterly and eternally immune to reactivity. And when we practice the Buddha's teachings, it's a way of getting in touch with that level of awareness and resting into that. That level of awareness is the ultimate refuge. If we can ground ourselves in that and live out of that all the time, then 
despite old age sickness and death, despite impermanence, despite other people and they are their faults and their reactivity, we can be at peace. And thanks to being at peace, we can be steady and encouraging for others. Which is the goal of Buddhist practice, to become the sort of person who is like that, ultimately 24-7. And it's a gradual process, it's practice, 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 and even if you can only do it for a minute a day at first, then you can extend that to two minutes, maybe it becomes an hour, maybe it becomes eventually half the day, except the times when you lose it, but then you regain it again. Eventually, you get, with lots of training, it does take a lot of training, but it's worth it, you can eventually become a person like the Buddha, who we are told was grounded in that level of awareness that level of awareness that is immune to reactivity, immune to greed, hatred and delusion, immune to the domination of the ego mind. Me, 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 what about me, what about me all the time? That could just perpetually be in that open-hearted, other-regarding, wise mind state the whole time, able to be grounded and encouraging for everybody The world needs people like that. And in the midst of a crisis, it has never been more apparent that people who can keep their head in a crisis, not just keep their head, but ground themselves and have a wise and kindly heart are so precious. And it is, in a way, the responsibility for of every human being to make the most of the human condition because the human condition is not just the reality of old age, sickness and death but it is the possibility of Buddhahood like a jewel that is hidden within each one of us but if we can ground ourselves and go deep enough we can mine into the opportunity of humanity itself and find that jewel and draw it to the surface and become it. The jewel represents Bodhi, Buddhahood, Bodhicitta. So it's all there for you and uh, I wish you well with your practice, 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 practice. And when you lose patience with yourself and with other people, just have patience and pick yourself up and try again.